And my goal is in 20 years to have a biological age of 20 years of age. Every couple of years, computers become more powerful and uh, the prices go down. Well, now the same is happening with biology. Aging is the mother of all chronic diseases. That means if we stop aging, we stop Alzheimer's, we stop heart attacks, we stop all cancers. Aging is the mother of all chronic diseases. Well, we're here at RadFest. This is the first day. I'm Cody Dean. Uh, we've got Jose Cordero here with me. This is the second time I've had a talk with you, so this is really exciting. Uh, yeah, tell me what's going on. You're here at RadFest. You've been every year? Uh, absolutely. Since uh, we created this in 2015, okay. and we had the first one in 2016, one year later, in San Diego, which is also a beautiful location. But uh, we need to change places, so we have been around San Diego, Anaheim, uh, Vegas, so and more places in the future. Okay, very cool. And uh, so what do you do? I, I know you travel around the world a lot and you're very vocal and active spreading the word of immortality. Uh, what do you do outside of just the traveling and speaking? I know you wrote your book. You can show that if you'd like. And Yeah, well, I, I am an engineer from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I used to work in a former life in energy. Now I am all totally committed to longevity. Okay. And in fact, I did write this book, At the Death of Death, that you can see the book goes with the Thai. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a bestseller in 15 languages. So I have ties uh, with the book in different languages, in Spanish, in Chinese, okay. and, and different languages. So I explain how we are very close to reaching immortality. I believe that um, in five years, we will reach longevity escape velocity okay. that will allow us to live uh, one year more per year we survive. Okay. So we keep on living longer and longer and longer until 2045 when we should be able to rejuvenate everybody. And my goal is in 20 years to have a biological age of 20 years of age. Okay. So in, in all your travels, I know you go to a lot of longevity conferences and also freedom conferences. Uh, and all the talks and conversations you've had with people in this field, what do you find are the biggest struggles they have of getting us across that finish line? Because from my experience and what I've seen, a lot of people say, yeah, we're five years away from longevity escape velocity or we're five to 10 years away from radical life extension, but that timeline keeps getting pushed all the time. So what do you see are the roadblocks that uh, the researchers and scientists are running into that's causing that? Well, actually, uh, according to my friend Ray Kurzweil, um, the dates are more or less fixed. Huh? He has been saying for uh, 30, 40 years that by 2045, we will reach immortality through biological rejuvenation. Okay. He has never moved that date. And also reaching uh, longevity escape velocity, which is the previous stage, uh, he has been talking about 2029, 20, 2030, 2032. So we are about five years away from that. Okay. So according to him, these dates are more or less predictable because of exponential advances in technology. Biology now is moving as fast as um, uh, information technology. Okay. Uh, there is Moore's law for computers that every couple of years, computers become more powerful and uh, the prices go uh, down. Well, now the same is happening with biology. Since um, the genome, the human genome was sequenced, uh, biology and medicine has been digitized digitized. That is why this is moving so fast. And um, I am very optimistic that truly in five years we will reach longevity escape velocity. Uh, in 2024, last year, uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to uh, Google DeepMind for creating AlphaFold. AlphaFold was the first program that could um, uh, sequence uh, proteins to know how proteins are created, how proteins are folded. Alpha fold. Mm -hmm. And um, that would have been taking uh, humans thousands of years because to sequence ju just one protein, it's a PhD thesis. A PhD thesis. Imagine, and there are 200 million proteins. And this program, Alpha Fold, did it immediately, basically. Wow. Okay. Uh, so this is the power of artificial intelligence also helping now in biology. Okay. So I know Ray Kurzweil has said that about 2045, and he's been consistent for a long time. And, and to be fair, he's really good at predicting things. He's had a lot of things come true in the timeline, he said. 
But there's also a lot of other scientists and researchers who, for the last you know maybe 30 years or more, have said, oh, we're five to 10 years away. And yet for them, that timeline keeps getting pushed. And you know, there's there's got to be something that's happening that is causing that timeline to be pushed. If they're so bullish to say we're five to 10 years away, but they've been saying that for 30 years, what are they running into that's, that's holding them back? Um, <clears throat> well, first, this was uh, science fiction. To talk about uh, immortality was truly impossible. And then the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2012, Shinya Yamanaka discovered that aging can be reversed. Mm -hmm. Even me, before this Nobel Prize, I was not totally convinced that we should be able or we could be able to reverse aging. So indeed there were there were people, you know, uh, in science fiction books, uh, you read about immortality in science fiction. Like vampires uh, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, vampires, no, no, but also uh, Benjamin Button. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Brad Pitt getting younger and younger yes, and younger yeah, that was a good and, one. and some other um, uh, books and movies in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was basically science fiction. In mm -hmm. terms of science reality, this is just becoming possible mm -hmm. now. Uh, before it was impossible. So I think um, we are moving more or less uh, on time. Okay. Of course, I would like it to be even faster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to uh, have this faster, we need uh, more uh, money, more investments, more researchers. Um, yeah more participation from the public. And also people need to know that this is real and that we are very close to curing aging because today we consider that aging is the mother of all chronic diseases. Yes. That means if we stop aging, we stop Alzheimer's, we stop heart attacks, we stop uh, basically all cancers. So aging is the mother of all chronic diseases. Yes, and you touched on something that I've seen in my experience in talking to people is one of those roadblocks that keeps holding back the progress is, is the funding. We need the more money, like you say. Uh, but a big part of the reason why there's seemingly never enough funding for these projects is because uh, in my view and in, in, in the talks I've had with people in their view is over regulation because of archaic regulation that's never been changed or evolved over time to fit the new needs of human society. We we're stuck with those and uh, progress in science is not allowed to truly progress and be innovative and it needs freedom to be innovative. So in order to try to push it through and force the force it, you have to have massive amounts of funding to make it happen. But the only way to get massive amounts of funding is through investors who want return on investment. But longevity is, is too long of a return for people to really be bullish about jumping into that. So there's kind of a twofold issue I've seen of over-regulation combined with uh, too expensive to push things through trial. Mm -hmm. what, what can you say about that Yeah, absolutely. Um, Regulation uh, slows down every um, discovery, every advancement, and overregulation slows it down even more. Mm -hmm. So the USA, uh, the FDA, for example, the Food and Drug Administration, overregulates many sectors. Uh, that is why innovation is so slow. It takes so long, and it costs so much. Mm -hmm. For example, to develop a, a vaccine today, until COVID, until COVID, it would take at least ten years, and it mm -hmm. would cost, on average. Two billion dollars yeah. for a single vaccine. For other therapies, it could be fifteen or twenty years. Uh, but COVID showed that uh, vaccines and new therapies can develop be developed much more quickly and also much more cheaply. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to go through all the stages um, to do a human clinical trials, or we can accelerate it. In fact, in some countries, uh, there is what is called the right to try. Uh, for example, in Japan, uh, where the population is much older, if there is a new therapy that people think could be used for elderly people in their 80s, 90s, or even in their 70s, now they can do it. Okay. You know, And they should have the right to try uh, without being stopped by regulation. So there is a lot of regulation in the USA. But let me tell you, in Europe, it is worse. I live in Spain. And Europe is even more regulated than the USA. And then there are countries which are more open to change, like uh, Japan, China, uh, South Korea. Mm -hmm. Also, 
yeah, they are experimenting with new therapies. So I'm, I'm happy for competition also in regulations. Yes. If regulations have to compete, then uh, we are going to have more possibilities to have better therapies. Okay. So given that relationship between regulation and increasing the cost of trials, um, what do you say to the approach of having a zone kind of based on the same premise that Dubai was built on or Singapore with financial technology, where you know, even within its host country, it's given uh, streamlined approvals through uh, different regulations, which frees things up a lot. If that were to happen in the biotech industry, we would have a zone uh, within any host country, really, that gave biotechnology and biomedical industries the freedom to pursue and innovate at the speed that innovation has to have. Number one, obviously the easy answer is that would make things faster, but would that also make things cheaper? Uh, yes, absolutely. And one of the best examples that I like is Shenzhen, uh, which Shenzhen, is in front yeah. of Hong Kong in China, within continental China, but across Hong Kong. I actually went there about 40 years ago because I went to Hong Kong and then I crossed into mainland China. It was a fishing village, mm -hmm. uh, Shenzhen. Today, it's bigger than Hong Kong. Wow. Today, Shenzhen has about 12 million people, which is incredible from a fishing village. Huge. And why? Because this was created as a special economic zone within China. So even all the Chinese went to invest in Shenzhen and, and to develop many technologies. Now, uh, uh, Shenzhen is the uh, Chinese capital of drones, of... Um, oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, JD, is from Shenzhen, but many other companies in China are from there. Imagine, it has 12 million people. It's not a small fishing village right. anymore. And a huge uh, technological companies are based there also in uh, not just drones, but robotics, also manufacturing. Many U.S. companies actually design the products in the USA and then they manufacture in China, mm. mostly in Shenzhen. Okay. So it, so we know of Shenzhen, we know of uh, Dubai. Is there anywhere around the world that you know of, as well traveled as you are, that's doing that type of thing, but with the biotech industry specifically? Not really, and uh, we should have that. Uh, there have been small experiments, like probably in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, in Honduras, there is a tiny island called Roatan, mm -hmm. and they have tried to do some of these, uh, also medical tourism because they have these therapies that uh, you can go and, and have them for you uh, outside the FDA regulations. Also, the Bahamas has been trying to do this, mm. and uh, even some small islands in the Pacific Ocean, but it is too far away to go to the Pacific. So are these just like billionaires buying islands and then just trying to do their own thing? Is that what you're talking well, about there? Well, not billionaires buying islands, even though some have done that, like... Uh, <laughs> Um, the Virgin guy, what is his name? Uh, Richard Branson. Richard Branson. Richard Branson, yeah. Richard Branson, for example, and some other billionaires have bought small islands in the mm -hmm. Caribbean, but uh, they don't use it for uh, gene therapy or for stem cell therapies. But anyway, so some places in the Caribbean, like it, also in Panama, Panama has some of the best stem cell um, clinics in the world mm -hmm. um, because they were not allowed to do that in the USA. And uh, American doctors actually have gone down to Panama right. or to Honduras or to the Bahamas. So I think this is good. We need competition. If the FDA yeah. is too uh, stubborn or too strict or too slow, then we we can go somewhere else. Yeah, we know a lot of the companies that are here at Radfest that have done exactly that. They're U.S.-based companies, but they go to uh, you know Mexico and Panama in order to have that freedom for for different aspects of their business. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. And talking about Mexico, you know, you can go from San Diego to Tijuana, just crossing the border, and the price goes four times. You know, it's it's right. incredible. The same thing, the same therapy at a quarter of the cost. Okay. So you've been working with us a lot uh, with Immortalis. So with everything we just talked about of uh, Shenzhen and Dubai, but there's not really anything that's doing that in the biotech industry in a big way, other than some smaller projects in the Caribbean. What do you have to say about Immortalis, which is kind of that first uh, Dubai of biotech? 
it would be fantastic. Uh, if this moves along as we expect it to happen, uh, this would be revolutionary. It will be uh, taking um, anti-aging longevity into a new level mm -hmm. uh, and to go through an exponential growth because since these uh, therapies, these treatments cannot be done in the USA, uh, you know, Americans and Europeans or, and Asians could go to Immortalis, wherever it is finally located. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good. And again, I believe in competition. Yeah. I believe in free markets. And I believe in people decided what, to, what they want to do with their money, with their life and with themselves. I think competition is a really good word for that because Immortalis will be the competition for the host country, wherever it is. It's just, we're here in the US in Vegas right now. So let's just say it's right here. We have Immortalis, but then everyone's gonna wanna come here for the medical tourism. And that's gonna suck economy out of the outside US uh, industry. And it's gonna force the rest of the country to have to keep up and evolve their regulation to at least come closer to the structure Immortalis will have, should it be as successful as we know it will be. And so I think that kind of internal competition is is a really fun thing. It's going to be fun to see how that plays out in the coming uh, years. Uh, absolutely. And uh, we should uh, begin with this anywhere in the planet. And then when there is enough competition also, the USA will have to see that this is good. And yeah. therefore, you cannot block it. You cannot regulate it. Right. I mean, over-regulate it. Yeah. So uh, an, an example of medical tourism is uh, also in Latin America. In Mexico, you can have uh, hair implants and um, um, uh, dentists, which mm -hmm. are, again, at a quarter of the price than in the USA. So yeah. this medical tourism exists. I also know in Colombia, many people go mm -hmm. to Colombia for uh, hair transplants. Mm -hmm. And many other things, going to the dentist. I might have to go get hair transplants before too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we might have uh, therapies to have your uh, hair grow back as well. But um, anyway, um, we need uh, competition. We, we need innovation uh, because uh, we are beginning to understand how biology works, how we lose our hair, right. you know, and why it doesn't happen so much in women and it happens more in men. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited. We are going to discover so many things now that we understand the biological code of life. After sequencing the genome, we are discovering many things. Yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, I know people are seem like they're trying to get into the room now. It's kind of getting noisy, so we should probably call this short. Yeah. Uh, but thanks for coming and talking to us, Jose. As always, it's a pleasure. And if you haven't read it, read his book, The Death of Death. It is phenomenal. A very good read. In, in uh, 15 languages. 15 you, different languages. You can read it in Chinese, in Russian, Japanese, Turkish, Arabic. So, yeah, my goal in life is to kill death before death kills me. That is the biggest goal on the planet. I think everyone should be trying to do that. Yes. So my pleasure to be with you, Yes, thank Cody. you, Jose. And what do you and always say? Viva la revolution. Viva la revolution. And viva immortalis. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, viva <Jose>. immortalis. <laughs>